Well, as you know, last week we were looking at John chapter 4, verses 1 through 42, which is a, a, a very large section to try to deal with in, in one sitting. Uh, thankfully, we have the evening services, and we were able to go back and, and pick up one theme. We're going to pick up another one this evening. Uh, but there are also those passages in Scripture that are only a few verses long that are easier to read and um, don't deal with as many uh, particulars. And that is what we're going to be looking at this morning. What I'd like to do is simply read for you, um, I guess, well, three verses, verses 43 through 45. And that will be our text for this morning. This is what uh, John, through the inspiration of the Spirit of God, writes. After the two days he went forth from there into Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they themselves also went to the feast. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding uh, this morning. Now again, when Jesus called his first disciples, he characterized the work that he was calling them to do as fishing for men. Now likely because they were fishermen, and as you know, uh, this was something that they could relate to. I think there's also something to the fact that Jesus chose fishermen to do the work of fishing for men because they were already familiar with what it was to fish. He wanted them, of course, to do this now with regard to the world of men. Now, one thing we often do when we read texts like that and we see what Jesus called them to do was not to understand that this is something actually that the Lord wants all of us to do. This was not a work that was peculiar to them. Now, if you've been a part of the Wednesday study, you know that that was certainly Spurgeon's conviction he believed that this is a work that all of us are called to do. A few Wednesdays ago, we saw him using the analogy of fishing to describe the Lord's work in our lives, what it is he is calling us to do, that we are to draw men together with what's called the gathering bait, to catch their interest in some way, to get them together so that we can uh, use the, the catching bait, as it were, uh, to land them in the kingdom of heaven or to bring them into the gospel boat, so to speak, uh, with a specific application of the gospel. Spurgeon's whole ministry was geared at converting the lost because that is what he believed that the Lord called him to do, but not just him, the whole church. Now, how are we to go about doing this? Well, we are to do it in the way Jesus called his disciples. He says in Matthew 4.19, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Uh, what better way to learn about fishing than to go to the master fisherman himself? Now, as we go through the Gospel of John, we not only see something of Jesus' heart towards the lost and desiring that these men come to faith in him, but we also see how he goes about catching these fish how he gathers together his lost sheep. By God's grace, as we see this, this should encourage us to do the same, bearing in mind that our Lord Jesus Christ didn't give up fishing once he sacrificed himself and died on the cross and, of course, rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven. His work wasn't done. Jesus is still seeking his sheep. He's still fishing for men. Only now, the way he does it is through his church. He does it through us. And again, we all have varying gifts. We all have varying responsibilities. But this is the goal that we are all to be working towards. That is bringing people into the kingdom of heaven. Now, last week, or last time, as I've already mentioned, we saw a great example of how Jesus does this in his approach to the Samaritan woman and through her to an entire city of Samaritans. Let me just mention again the things that we saw briefly because we did go through them quickly and because what we're looking at this morning isn't going to take a great deal of time to explain. But we first saw that every opportunity that the Lord gives to us uh, is something that is a divine appointment. Every opportunity we have to share the gospel, even as Jesus said he had to pass through Samaria so that he might meet this woman at the well. 
We need to see that that is true and try to make the best use of every opportunity God gives to us. And by the way, everyone we run into can actually turn into an opportunity. I um, had a Greek professor in, um, in college who was very much geared toward evangelism and literally whenever I was with him anywhere outside the school and even in the school, he was always either witnessing to somebody or he was praying with them. And I think the Lord has used him to bring a number of people to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, whenever possible, we need to try to make the gospel as concrete as we possibly can by connecting it to something that our audience is familiar with. I mean, such as what Jesus did when he called his first disciples who were fishing. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, as we've just read. And what he said to the Samaritan woman at the well in verse 10 of John chapter 4, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you can connect the gospel to something that has to do with that person's life, perhaps not only will you make it more visible to them, but if they don't happen to receive Christ at that time, perhaps every time they look at that thing, they'll be reminded of what it is you told them. Thirdly, that we need to be willing to share the gospel at all times with whomever the Lord might bring into our path, even those that we may not particularly like, although for Christian that's not really an option the Lord gives to us, right? Uh, remember the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other, and yet Jesus reached out to this Samaritan woman, took the time with her, and even with the whole city of Samaritans to bring the gospel to them. Fourthly, we saw that we shouldn't get sidetracked from the gospel into debates that don't matter. Uh, when the Samaritan woman noticed or saw that Jesus was a prophet, she asked Jesus to settle a dispute that existed between the Jews and the Samaritans up to that time. That is, where should one worship and how should one worship? Well, Jesus didn't get sidetracked, but he kept the topic on that which mattered the most, that which she needed to hear, which was the gospel. Make sure when you're evangelizing that you do tell them what it is that God offers. You can live forever in heaven. Make sure you tell them about the gift that God has to give and make sure you let them know it is a gift. It's not something they have to earn. Can't work for it. You'll never be able to merit it. But something God gives freely. And then, of course, tell them who it is that gives it, who is, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ. Tell them that this gift can alone satisfy them. That's what Jesus meant when he said in verses 13 and 14, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. By the way, if you've trusted Jesus Christ, you know that's true. And so you should be able to share your personal testimony with them and say, you know what? I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. I don't need anything more. I don't need the world. I don't need the things of the world. Those things don't satisfy. All I need is Christ. Now that I have him, I have everything that I need. That's what personal testimonies are meant to convey, is that these things are in fact true. As I've said before, make sure you point them to Jesus. I mean, Jesus had to convince this woman who he was before she would be able to receive this gift. Make sure you point to Jesus Christ. In verse 10, he says this, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Make sure you point them to Jesus because he's the only one who can give this gift of eternal life. And then know that the Lord is going to use the efforts that you put out, the efforts that you make in the lives of those you reach out to in some way. You're not always going to be seeing people coming to Christ. And sometimes I think when we don't see that happen, we say, you know what? I just can't do it. I'm just not good. I'm not gifted. I, I, I can't bring, I, you know, I just can't share it well enough to get, compel people to come right away. But we do need to remember that there is a process involved here. Uh, when you share the gospel with somebody, you might be breaking ground 
for the first time. You might be the first person to share it with them. And people typically don't come the first time they hear it. Uh, you might be planting seed in ground that somebody else broke. You might be watering that seed. Or maybe you'll have the opportunity actually to reap. Remember what Jesus told his disciples? He said, lift up your eyes. The harvest of the fields are already white unto harvest. He said that when all these Samaritans he saw coming out of the city towards him, and then Jesus reminded his disciples, I have sent you to go labor in a field that you didn't plant. Others have labored in this field and you have entered into their labors. There are people who have gone before you, people who have done some work of breaking ground and planting seed, and now the harvest has come. Realize that you know, this whole thing is basically a process. And so knowing that's true, break as much ground as you possibly can. Plant as much seed as you can. Water seed where you find the seed has been planted. And of course, as the Lord gives opportunity, reap as much as you're able, knowing that the Lord is going to reward you for everything that you do in each of these areas with a reward that you're going to be able to keep forever. Now this morning I want us to consider one more principle from our passage that basically has two sides to it. And that is when to work the ground and when not to. Now we've already read in verse 33 that Jesus eventually moved on from where he was. Uh, in verse 43 we read, after the two days he went forth from there into Galilee. Galilee was his original destination before he stopped, as it were, for a little bit of time to reap this harvest in Samaria. Now we know that the gospel was given first to the Jews. But even though that was true, Jesus graciously shared it with the Samaritans. He even stayed with them for two more days to ground them in this truth. You know, the better you understand something, the more quickly and easily you can communicate it to others. There's an incident where Jesus surveyed the Old Testament with two men on the road to Emmaus. And their lives were forever changed as their hearts burned within them over the course of a seven-mile walk. Well, how much more could Jesus equip these Samaritans and, and communicate truth when he spent two more days with them? See, the better you know the truth, the more you're able to use it skillfully, which is why we should be encouraged to study the gospel and know it as best as we possibly can that we might more effectively share it with other people and when they actually do come to Christ to try to build them up, to disciple them, to give them the tools they need in order to serve him. But as he continued now into Galilee, we do see something that was a bit unexpected. He passed by Nazareth, which shouldn't be a surprise to you by now because of the other passages we read. He passed by his hometown, the place where he was raised because we read in verse 44, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. He went instead to the other regions of Galilee where they knew that he would, or they would receive him because of their earlier response in Jerusalem. John already told us in chapter 2, verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name observing his signs which he was doing. And then he tells us now in verse 45, that is John tells us, so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they themselves also went to the feast. So this morning what I want us to do is consider two things when you evangelize from what we see Jesus doing here. That you shouldn't waste your time with those who don't want to listen. And we know there's plenty of people like that. But spend your time instead with those who do. Now that should really not be something new to uh, our understanding, but I think it's something we do well to reflect on because I think sometimes we end up spending most of our time with people who don't want to listen to us. And it's the people that we know best and the people who are in our own households or people who are friends because we have established relationships with them. But we're gonna find sometimes those are the least fruitful connections that we have to pursue 
and we need to seek other connections. So first of all, don't waste your time with those who don't want to listen. As I've said before, what Jesus does here almost seems a bit out of character because Jesus, you know, doesn't usually avoid people. But we do see him doing that here. He purposely avoided Nazareth for the reasons we've already seen. But that really shouldn't surprise us, that Jesus would avoid somebody because we know that there are situations, there are times in which the Lord actually prevents the gospel from going into different areas because he doesn't want the gospel to go there. Uh, we don't maybe think about this as often as we do, but we need to realize that he kept his truth from a, a majority of the world from the time of Adam until Christ. And he dealt with a very small segment of mankind that eventually became a people planted in Palestine. A, a very small minority among the number of people that existed in the world. Now why did the Lord withhold his light from them, the light of his truth, that they that really through alone which they could be saved? Why did he do that? It's because of their sin. They didn't deserve to hear it. Nobody really does. But it was also because it wasn't his time. God would be gracious to them later. As we know, when um, basically his people were centered in Israel, he, used, he would draw people to Israel in order for them to be saved. They had to be proselytized to Judaism. But when the new covenant comes and the work of Jesus is complete, he sends them out. And he says, go out into all the world and preach the gospel. But until that time, you see, it was more magnetic. It was more drawing people than it was radiating or sending people. We see that when Jesus came into the world that he first went to Israel. He didn't go to the Gentiles. He, he really didn't go to the Samaritans except there are, you know, on these occasions where there were exceptions because Jesus said on one occasion to the Syrophoenician woman, let the children first be satisfied. They have to be satisfied first. The children of the covenant, God's children, they need to hear this truth first before it goes to someone else. And so Jesus also said on other occasions, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When the Lord later sent Paul and Silas out to preach, there were places the Spirit of God would not allow them to go. Luke writes in Acts 16, verses 6 through 8, they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. Now again, it wasn't yet the Lord's time. Later, he would let them go into those regions. We know that's true from the rest of the book of Acts. But at that particular point, it was not time. Now, why did Jesus avoid Nazareth? Well, because as we've seen, he knew they would not believe him. They would not receive him. I've already told you that sometimes it's difficult to know exactly how to synchronize the Gospels, how they fit together. But it's quite possible that after Jesus, after he, he goes into Galilee, as we see here, and then returns to Cana of Galilee, where he first did his miracle of making the water into wine, and that's going to be actually our next text, that he will go to Nazareth, he will minister in their synagogue, as we read this morning, with the result that they wanted to kill him. Again, as we read in Luke chapter 4 this morning. Now, what was the problem? Why were they like this? Well, there are basically two reasons. The first was they really didn't want to hear the truth, did they? Because they were sinners and their hearts were bent against the gospel. But the second reason was, as we've already seen, they didn't want to hear the truth from somebody that they knew, from somebody with whom they were too familiar because the old adage, the, the old axiom, as it were, is true, familiarity breeds contempt. I think we know that is the case. Nazareth is where Jesus grew up. And as Jesus said on more than one occasion, no prophet is received well at home. We read in Matthew 13, verses 54 through 58, he came to his hometown, began teaching them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? 
And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. They just could not accept as a prophet of God somebody that they had known as a child and seen grown up in their town. You know, Jesus had the same problem with his family. I mean, he said... Prophet doesn't have honor except in his hometown and in his own household. Well, Jesus did have the same problem in his household, didn't he? There's this whole list of brothers that Jesus had. On one occasion, we were told they were basically mocking Jesus, telling him to go up to a feast. Um, Show yourself there if you're the Messiah. But because they weren't yet believing in him, we read in John chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Did did Jesus do something wrong? Was he not a great evangelist, uh, not the best one who's ever lived? Was he a failure because the people didn't love him and accept what he had to say and they wanted to kill him instead? (laughs) He was the perfect prophet, wasn't he? He did everything exactly right. When you do things exactly right, it doesn't mean that people are going to love you for it. Okay, they were seeking to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths was near. Therefore his brothers said to him, leave here and go into Judea so that your disciples also may see your works which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers were believing in him. Although it is interesting that they did later. Remember what happened when Joseph, Joseph the son of uh, Jacob, had his uh, coat of many colors and had his dream about the sun, moon, and the stars bowing down to him? Remember what happened when Eliab, the oldest bro- the son of Jesse, uh, how he responded when David showed up on the battlefield and he was willing and ready to go out and fight against Goliath? Basically, they could not accept the fact that God would use somebody that they knew like this in this way. It's easier to respect the authority or appreciate the gifts and abilities of a stranger rather than somebody that you know well. And why is that? Well, it basically boils down to pride. You know, this person that I know really can't be greater than I am. And that's why it's difficult sometimes to evangelize in certain circumstances, why it's difficult for children to evangelize their parents. You know, I mean, who are you? You know, I, I, mean, I raised you from a babe. Who are you to tell me that that's what I need to do if your parents happen to be unbelievers? Or difficult for parents to evangelize their children. Or siblings to share the gospel with each other. Or when you try to minister the good news to people that you went to school with or people that you grew up with. I mean, besides the fact that they're unconverted and they don't want to hear it, is the fact that they know you too well to receive this from you. Now, let's not uh, mistake this to to say that we need to be strangers to everybody because you do need to build relationships with other people if you want to share the gospel with them. But I think what Jesus is telling us here is you need to be careful not to get too close to them because the more familiar they become with you, the less likely they're going to be to respect what you have to say, partly because spending so much time with you, they see your flaws. And the more flaws they see in you, the more they're going to excuse themselves for not believing what you have to tell them. By the way, this is a very good reason to live as godly a life as you possibly can, especially when you're around unbelievers. But realize that there is a critical load. I mean, we have flaws. We all have flaws. They're going to see those flaws. You can only keep them covered for so long. I mean, think about the person you admire and respect the most that you've spent the most time with. You spend enough time with them, you begin to see problems. And the more problems you see, the less respect we tend to have for those individuals. You know, it's much better, let's say, at the beginning when somebody takes this position of authority in office rather than at the end when you've seen their track record for a few years. But again, realize that flaws are not the only problem because Jesus didn't have any flaws And they had a chance to see that for all the years they knew him. 
the people in that country, the people in that town, the people who were in his own household, and yet they wouldn't listen to him because of pride. Now again, there's reasons why people won't listen to the gospel. There's plenty of reasons. Maybe it isn't God's time. Maybe there's just too much sin in their lives. Really, everybody has so much sin, they're not going to listen to the gospel unless God breaks through. Sometimes it's because you haven't yet built a bridge to them. You don't know them well enough, really, to be able to share something that is that intimate. I mean, what are the two things that people don't like to talk about today because it's a touchy subject, but religion and politics. You do need to get to know them at some level. But sometimes it's because you've built too many bridges as it were, to that individual, and they just simply know you too well. Well, one thing is clear here, that there may be impediments to the gospel. Don't waste too much time with people who don't want to listen. Spend your time with people who want to listen. I mean, there is a reason why when Jesus sent his disciples out to the towns and villages of Israel, and he told them in, in Matthew 10, verses 10 th- or 14 through 15, whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words, as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. I want you to notice that Jesus didn't say to them, if they don't receive you, continue to work with them. Continue to preach to them. Continue to try to get them to receive you, even if they don't. Why didn't he tell them to do that? Well, because they're hard ground. You need to go find a place where they're going to receive you. There's lots of other people who need to hear the gospel, not just these. And you need to try to reach them as well. But there's also another principle that Jesus gives in Matthew 7, verse 6. He says, do not give what is holy to dogs. And do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now Jesus here was not talking about literal dogs or literal swine, but what he meant was that if you share the gospel with someone and they don't want to hear it, and they get violent and they they make it clear they're not going to listen to you, well then don't take what is holy, the gospel, and continue to give it to them because they're just going to dishonor God more and more. Perhaps this is not the time. Now, perhaps in the future, the Lord will prepare their hearts. Perhaps he will soften their hearts through circumstances. But now it's not going to be fruitful to continue to go after them. So what what do you do? Well, if they don't listen to you, Jesus says, move on. Jesus passed over Nazareth, but he did go to some place where he knew they would listen in verse 45. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they themselves also went to the feast. You see, that's what you need to do. Bypass the ones who aren't going to listen. Go to the ones where there is a hope that they are going to listen. Now that, I think, is simple enough. But here's one more thing that I think we should note here. And it's the same thing that we saw at the very beginning. Note the priority that Jesus has of evangelism. Evangelism was his priority. Now, John Wesley, like Spurgeon, who I've already mentioned, uh, also shared this opinion. When you think about some of the greatest evangelists who ever lived, certainly Jesus is one of them, even though the reaction that most of the people had toward him was hatred at the end of his three and a half years, they wanted to kill him. Sometimes effective evangelism means you're going to have a lot of angry people, right? We also know that was a part of God's plan because Jesus had to die on the cross in order to save us from our sins. But the Apostle Paul, John Wesley, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, Spurgeon, what is it that made their ministries, uh, what was it that was unique about their ministry? Basically, it was their priority. Their priority was evangelism. You see, there are other things that we do in the church of God. I mean, we do have to grow spiritually. We do have to worship the Lord and grow in our worship. We do need to pray. But it really all boils down to this one particular purpose, and that is we need to reach out to others with the gospel 
and we should try to make that a priority. There are those who need you. There are those who need your gifts. But there are also those who need you more, and that is those who are lost and in danger of hell. Now, John Wesley writes in this one particular quote that I would uh, like to share, as though this is the only thing that matters, even though we know there were other things. He says this, You have nothing to do but to save souls. Therefore, spend and be spent in this work. And go not only to those that need you, but to those that need you most. It is not your business to preach so many times and to take care of this or that society, but to save as many souls as you can, to bring as many sinners as you possibly can to repentance. So basically what he's saying, and this was, this was advice that he gave to his, his students, to his preachers, to these itinerant preachers that he sent out to preach the gospel in various places. Uh, don't worry about those who just have needs. There's going to be other people who will meet those needs. Your priority needs to be the gospel. And the thing is, because we oftentimes find the gospel and sharing the gospel to be so intimidating, we often shy away from that particular work to do other things and so that you know, we'll be actively serving the Lord but still not doing the most important thing. And that's what we need to do, otherwise Christ's work isn't going to be done. So the last question I want to ask is this. How can we? How can we do this? How can we make it our priority? I've already told you that, um, uh, you know, that we need to build bridges. I know that all of us here, if we had the opportunity, would probably like nothing more than to give all of our time to sharing the gospel with somebody else who needs to hear it, who want to know about Jesus, who want to learn more about him because it's one of the most fulfilling and blessed things that you can possibly do in this life. The problem is, how do you find these kind of people? How do you run into them? How do you cultivate this kind of relationship? Well, you do know you need to build bridges. If you don't build bridges, if you don't develop relationships with your neighbors, to put it in other terms, as Spurgeon said, if you don't chum the waters to try to gather people together, uh, you're never really going to know who it is that's interested, who it is that the Lord may be working in to give a hunger for the gospel. You won't be able to use the catching bait, in other words, the, you know, the actual application of the gospel that's going to bring them to faith in Christ. Well, how do you build these bridges? Well, you know what? That's a broad question, isn't it? The answer to that question is extremely broad. It's so varied that it, you know, we could spend the rest of our lives trying to think of ways to build bridges to different people in their different situations. So let me just offer this principle instead in closing. I'm just going to mention it briefly now, but this evening we're going to look at it a bit more carefully. Where there's a will, there's a way. If you want to reach somebody, you're going to find a way to do it. So the real question is, how can you want to do this? Why should you want to do it? Well, your motivation is because this is what Jesus calls you to do. Jesus said to his disciples in Mark 16, verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. You should want to do it because Jesus tells you to do it. You should also want to do it because think of what's going to happen to your neighbor if you don't do it. Uh, he's going to die. She's going to die and suffer in hell forever. That's what the Bible says. So love for Jesus and love for your neighbor should be the motivations. It should be the strongest motivations you can possibly have. And really, if you have these, you have everything you need. John Wesley noted this when he wrote this. Give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. And I care not whether they be clergymen or laymen, they alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven upon earth. You see, this is what we need to pray for. Pray that the Lord would give us this grace. Not to fear men, but to fear God. 
Pray that he would take away your desire for the things that get in your way, the things of this world, and strengthen your desire for him and for his kingdom. You see, it's only if you have that kind of heart that the Lord is really going to be able to use you to fish for souls, to be able to do what it is that our Lord Jesus calls us to do. So may the Lord give us that kind of heart. May he give us grace to seek that kind of attitude, that kind of character, to become more like Jesus in all these things so that we might, um, that we might be better fishermen. Now this evening, as I've said, we're going to deal a little bit more with, with the kind of effort and the kind of zeal the Lord calls us to have in living the Christian life and pursuing these kinds of things. But let's just say, for now, Jesus wants us to fish, and we need this kind of zeal. So let's pray that God would grant it to us. Let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and ask for his help uh, to do this.